Greetings and welcome to the Artifact Electronics channel. Today we're going to have a look at a Sony Tektronics Model 305 which I picked up locally. A little bit of history on this type of scope is that it was built by Sony Tektronics in Japan from 1979 through 1991. The retail price of it was 1,700 US dollars when released and in its last year of sales it cost 3,600 dollars. It has a 5 megahertz dual trace oscilloscope and a three mode digital multimeter. It is a portable scope that will run off AC batteries or an external DC supply. The scope came as you can see it also included one probe and that is a P6101 probe that is rated for 34 megahertz which is plenty for a 5 megahertz scope. It also had a pair of DMM leads, an original user manual, and a bag of random parts. It's in pretty good shape physically. It is missing, oh and you can't see that right now, but it's missing one of the hinge covers on this side. Not required for operation but annoying nonetheless. So I hope that sooner or later I'll find one of them and make the scope whole again. The front part of the protective cover is also missing, probably long gone. In general the scope is uh, pretty basic. It offers basic uh, dual channel controls, nothing out of the ordinary, no bells and whistles. The uh, the uh, DMM inputs are on the side over here and this is the external DC input and a ground connection and on the other side it has external channel 1, channel 2 and trigger input. So this scope has a problem in that it, it has a problem with the vertical deflection and what we're going to do here is have a look, try to trace the problem and repair it and also give a general uh, do a general checkup of the instrument see if everything else is working properly including the digital multimeter. The instrument was advertised as being in full working condition so I went over to the fellow's house and uh, unfortunately it was not in full working condition and I'll show you what I saw. So let's power this guy up and uh, a DMM2. So right now what I have set up is I have the, po uh, the uh, probe plugged into channel 2 and uh, let's center the uh, trace on channel 2 and use the calibration signal to see how things are working. So we can see a nice calibration signal here. However, this is where the problem is. Let's say I move the trace up. It essentially clips on the top of the screen. Same thing on the bottom of the screen. And it does that on both channels. Now to make sure that it, this isn't the calibration circuit, uh, I'm going to test it with uh, I'm going to test it with a function generator also. I need to add that when I showed this to the owner or the seller, uh, who was asking uh, he was asking a premium price for it, even though I didn't really balk at that because I wanted this particular instrument. It was in such good shape. But anyway, showing him the fault uh, enabled me, he actually offered to go down quite drastically on the price with the uh, just get it out of here out, uh, attitude. So we made the deal and brought this guy home. So now, 
Let's turn on the uh, function generator, which is an HP 3314A, and just give it some basic waveforms. So the function generator is plugged into input. Let's see, it's plugged into input 1 on the scope. So let me recall my setting on the uh, function generator and uh, switch back to uh, channel 1. So, as uh, you can probably already see, it's doing the same thing with a sine wave, but uh, doing the same test, the same type of test that we did before. Here's our sine wave as we move it up it gets clipped on top as we move it down it gets clipped on the bottom so it is not the uh, calibration output that's doing that but rather something inside the scope for good measure let's look at an external square wave same results and of course a triangle So uh, we need to find out what is causing this. Now it can be one of two things. The first thing is, and uh, first thing is, is that the signal, the uh, vertical deflection signal, that is uh, connected to the vertical deflection plates in the CRT, is faulty, and is clipping for some reason or, or other, and that's why the display is basically showing the exact signal that we're putting into it. One other option that uh, that may exist is that the CRT itself or the deflection plates in the CRT are defective. So when it hits a certain voltage they just stop deflecting. Now from my experience with, with scopes that is relatively rare if it shows a good signal like this that there really is a big problem with the uh, uh, with the CRT itself, especially in this case where the uh, fault is completely symmetrical. But uh, I think a simple test to determine that is to probe the signals that are directly fed into the CRT and see what those signals look like on another on another oscilloscope, and that'll let us decide. Uh, where to look for the fault, or whether this is a total loss if the CRC, CRT is bad. So next I would like to have a look and see what the uh, vertical deflection signal that are generated on the 305 look like on another oscilloscope, and uh, to see if the reason for the distortion is something that the uh, CRT is causing on the 305 or uh, the, uh, the vertical deflection signal itself is faulty. If we look at a partial schematic of the CRT driving circuit, we'll see that uh, the vertical signal uh, comes in over here is fed straight through into the vertical output amplifier on top and is then inverted and fed into the uh, second vertical output amplifier. Now these two output amplifiers are custom chips so hopefully they are not the cause of the problem but uh, because the distortion or the clipping is perfectly symmetrical, it is unlikely that both of these have gone at the same time. So my guess is that the vertical signal input itself is faulty. But to make sure that that is in fact true, let's have a look at uh, P260 and P280, which, are, which feed the... Uh, upper and lower deflection plates in the CRT respectively and see what those look like. Here's the scope with its armor removed. It's pretty easy. 
first uh, we take off the rear plate which is held in place by a single captive thumb screw then there's a frame piece that I think is used to make it look pretty and align the case once it's on the scope and then of course there's the case itself right here I took it off without removing the bag and the protective side thing which isn't really necessary but there it is quick run rundown is uh, basically power input and regulation most of power input and regulation is done here and uh, it's probably a good time to talk about uh, proper safety protocols when dealing with a device like this as you can see you know AC is coming in here uh, it's got exposed AC here's the main transformer uh, and uh, all sorts of high voltage stuff over here <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a lecture on uh, on uh, bench uh, repair safety I think that subject's been visited many many times online and uh, uh, I hope uh, you will either do some research on it or refresh your knowledge before delving into something like this Another thing, of course, to mention is that uh, there's a CRT tube in here. This particular CRT tube uh, runs at several kilovolts. There's lots of capacitors here. Keep in mind that capacitors get charged up. And by simply turning off the instrument, the charge doesn't go away. And also keep in mind that the CRT tube is one very large capacitor that will hold a charge for very long and uh, even after it's turned off it will still bite you and uh, that can be pretty painful and disorienting so be safe but on with the tour of what we have here here we can see is uh, the battery pack which consists of six C batteries and my guess is that these batteries are completely dead by now over here is the uh, driver board for the CRT and uh, one thing we can see is that normally the driver board for the CRT is also called the neck board and that's because it's sitting on the neck of the CRT I think because of space limitations uh, in this particular scope they're pretty much running uh, all of the neck signals up to this board uh, through wires but in essence this is the neck board and uh, part of the chassis usually uh, but that's all on this board what we looked at earlier is uh, we are interested in P220 which is the uh, positive part of the vertical deflection signal and uh, here's P2 what is that 280 actually this is P260 and this is P280 which is the complement of P260 and these wires are going straight to the vertical deflection plates in the CRT. What we also have on this side is we have underneath yet another plastic cover which uh, I should probably remove also. That is of course if I can find where I hid the uh, screwdriver. It's right over here. This is held in place by a single screw. And uh, what we are looking at now is uh, this board is the DMM input board. This board right underneath it is the DMM A to D converter and uh, down here we can see part of the main board that pretty much covers the entire bottom of this unit but we'll get back to that later at this point let's uh, bring in the services of another scope and uh, see what the deflection signal looks like on another scope as compared to what's being displayed here
I've now pressed the second scope into service so we can double check what the deflection signals are looking like. So uh, let's connect channel 1 of the uh, Tektronix TBS1202B first to the chassis and next to P260 which is the positive uh, deflection signal. So there's our triangle which looks which shows up identically. Now this uh, yes it is already set to AC coupling. So now let's go in and move the trace up, not side to side up. And as we can see, it is clipping completely in place. Digital scope shows a bit of a lag when we're completely going, when it's completely clipped to a straight line. But as we come back, or we go down, it does the exact same thing in that it clips and then fixes itself again when you're going back in the middle. I think what this tells us is that the, the tube works correctly over here and the fault is entirely in the uh, in the vertical deflection signal that is coming in. So let's have another look at the schematics and see and come up with a plan of how to trace what could be wrong, going wrong with that signal. Now that we've seen that the signal distorts just the same on another scope, uh, we can be reasonably sure that uh, the uh, problem or the fault is not in the CRT itself, but rather in the uh, deflection signal coming in being split and made into a differential signal and then pumped out again. As I said before, uh, because the uh, clipping is perfectly symmetrical, I don't think that this part of the circuitry is uh, responsible for that, but uh, that shouldn't prevent us from making some basic checks. I went ahead and made those checks and uh, basically checked to see if the uh, check the voltages that are coming in on the vertical output amplifiers. <clears throat> they use a bipolar 3 volt supply, both of them, and uh, measuring those returned showed that they were good. <clears throat> they both also use a 77 volt supply, which is probably used to amplify uh, the uh, signal uh, to a level that is required by the CRT and the 77 volts sat at 68 volts. So what can be wrong here? I mean it does point to a power supply problem. So the power supply basically is not generating the 77 volts correctly or there is something sitting on the 77 volt rail that is pulling it down. Now that's uh, checking for that is a little bit is a little bit more involved. So I'm going to go back and check the uh, supply part that generates the 77 volts. And the way that works is if we look at the transformer outputs. We see that uh, uh, one of the windings is supplying us with uh, 80 volts. Uh, so right here at point 0.4 we have the AC voltage of approximately 80 volts coming out. It's rectified, it's, uh, it's basically half wave rectified and uh, has a little uh, 
smoothing capacitor, well, a 10 microfarad smoothing capacitor, and passes the 80 volts straight on to the, uh, to the regulating circuit. So what this looks like is it's half wave rectified, it's only got a 10 mic capacitor on it, so it probably still has a pretty good ripple on it, but let's see where the 80 volts goes to. And the 80 volts goes to another board, this guy, and right in the middle we can see the 80 volts coming in over here. I measured the 80 volts and uh, it is approximately 82 volts. <clears throat> Didn't measure the ripple. Uh, but it comes in here and this is the regulator. It utilizes minus 3 volts which is, the, which is present. It generates a 77 volt rail which is also fed back to itself again over here. And measuring this <clears throat> showed the same 68 volts that were being uh, that that we measured at the output amplifiers. Not a whole lot in this circuit, so I went ahead and uh, powered down the, the the system and just did in circuit checks of all the components, and in circuit everything everything measured out correctly, <clears throat> including the resistors, which were all in the right value. So I turned power back on again and start probing around here and I saw the 68 volts here and here but uh, all of a sudden I noticed that when I uh, <clears throat> pushed down on the PC board with the probes to get a better connection this point jumped up to 77 volts the minute I let go of the probe or eased pressure on the probe this fell down to 68 again so I'm surmising at this point we do have a, a board defect a trace that is partially cracked something that is getting partially shorted. I have no idea at this point, but what I'm going to do next is sit down and stare at the PC board and see if, uh, if I can see anything untoward. So let's go and do that. So we're back with the scope on its back and uh, having a look at the affected area the uh, two transistors, which are part of the uh, 77 volt rail, are these two guys. Poked around a bunch, I tweaked the board, uh, I tweaked the frame to see if it made any difference, I reseated these connectors, and uh, nothing made a difference until I actually came and started pushing over here. Once I started pushing over there, something interesting happened, and in order to show you that, let me zoom out and turn the scope back on again. So, let's go and uh, create a partially clipped waveform that's trying to stick to the top of the screen. Now, when I push down in this area near those two transistors and uh, I don't have the, uh, I'm not measuring the voltage right now but I did that before and the voltage jumps to 77 volts the minute I let go it goes back to distortion and the minute I press down it looks good again now uh, Let's move the trace down to the bottom. And at the bottom, if we press in here again, we can kind of see the edges that, that the uh, clipping goes away. And the minute I let go, the clipping returns. So, uh, bit of a mystery, but not a bit of mystery, we kind of guessed that there was a fault in the PC board. So let's zoom back in. And uh, some of you may see it already, but after staring at it for yet some more time in that same area where I was pushing it down, 
I noticed that there was a hole over here which looks like a mounting hole especially uh, since there's a thread underneath that connects it to the chassis. You can faintly see but uh, this, this trace, this plane here has some scratches on it which indicates to me that at one point in time there was a screw in there and it looks like somebody removed the screw and forgot to put it back. That can be very easily proven. Let's turn off the scope and I went through my uh, drawer of screws and found an exact replacement. And now, let's see if that fixed the problem. So let's have a look back at the... Uh, let's actually put it right side up. Drum roll, please. We turn it on, and uh, looks like we fixed the problem. So, both by moving it in the vertical direction and by changing the amplitude, it is now displaying correctly. Just to make sure, let's try out the sign, see if it stays a sign when we move it up. And it looks like it does. Does it stay a sign when we change the amplitude? Looks like it. And finally the triangle. No, finally the uh, square wave. And uh, same thing. We can move it off the screen. And uh, at this point, it moves completely off the screen. But you can see here, since uh, since it has a, since the square wave has a very rapid rise time, you don't even see that. You don't see the rise and fall of the square wave on here. That's why it disappeared. So now that that's working. We should probably put it back together and do one final test, but before we do that, let's run through the DMM part of it real quick and see if that part's working. Before getting started with the DMM, I'm going to do a quick test. I pulled the battery pack and uh, do a quick measurement there and see if anybody's home. I'm going to the terminals. It Re reveals nothing. No, nada. There's nothing in those batteries. There's a date code of uh, 1986 on them. So I don't think it's too surprising that they have given up their lives. Now these are six C cells. And having checked on some prices, if I want to replace the 6C e cells, uh, it's probably going to cost me more than I paid for the scope. And since I don't have any immediate plans for uh, taking it into the field or running it off the battery, I will just uh, leave the old batteries in there. However, I will unsolder the uh, positive lead and insulate it because whenever the scope's driven off AC it's trying to charge the batteries and uh, trying to charge batteries this old uh, is probably not a good thing. So 
why don't I just remove the batteries and uh, discard them, dispose of them properly? It's because uh, if I happen to decide to replace them in the future, then I can just use the existing old batteries as a pattern and see exactly how they're connected and put in there and make and make a quick job of putting new batteries in there. Now, uh, let's look at the DMM. We're going to use the supplied heavy duty probes. And the first thing we'll do is we'll check if uh, each of the modes is nulled correctly. So we short the probes. And uh, start the meter, it's in DC volt mode, and uh, it's nulled. We go to AC volts, takes a little time, but eventually it uh, gets down to zero, or not. So that one's dancing around a little bit. Let's see what... Uh, there you go, it finally... Oh, no, it didn't. Let's see what the uh, kilo ohm says. Kilo ohm say 0.1. Now there is an adjustment screw. There is a single uh, zeroing screw, zeroing pot for all of the uh, for all three modes. Of course, I put it down. It goes to zero. and so does the AC. Now, since it has a single pot, it's an iterative process. You have to switch modes, null it, go to the next mode, null it, and so on and so forth. And uh, since the AC seems to be back, mostly back at zero, I'm not going to poke the hornet's nest here and try to make that adjustment, throw all the other ones off. Uh, we'll just call this, we'll just call this properly, properly zeroed. But uh, let's actually put some real values into it and see how it responds to those. DC first. I will, I will use the oldest piece of test equipment I have, which is right here, a Radio Shack. There you go. A Radio Shack 5-volt, 3 amp supply that came as a kit that I bought and built many, many years ago. So we are in DC mode, and from my contact, of course. We get we're pretty close to five volts here, so we'll call that one good. For the AC measurement, I will actually measure the uh, AC input into the instrument on the back. I generally have about I generally have an AC voltage of between 116 and a half to 117 coming out of my wall here. So let's see how close to that we are going to get. And I do that by going in here and in here and let it stabilize. And it's pro pretty much hitting 117. So that one's pretty good. Last but not least, the resistance part. And for that, <coughs> I'll take out my bag of random resistors and find. Uh, find a 1% resistor here somewhere, and uh, yes, we have 68K, a bunch of 68Ks over here, 1%. Put it over here. 
and, uh, and we get 68.6. Uh, it's approximately 1.5% error, taking into account the 1% tolerance on the resistor. I would say we're good on this too. So I think we can safely say that the uh, that the DMM works properly. That along with the with the scope working properly, we can say that the whole device is working. So let me put it back together and we'll do a brief wrap up. Well I put it all back together and I didn't even rip off any of the interconnects when sliding back the case, which has happened to me once or twice. Everything works. So at this point, uh, looking into the future, uh, in my channel, we won't, or I won't only be looking at test instruments, but also more fun things like uh, musical instruments, including effects boxes and synthesizers, uh, vintage vintage computers, video vintage video games. Uh, older pinball machines, arcade games, all of that stuff uh, all of that stuff will appear in this channel however uh, test instruments will always be an integral part here for two reasons first of all in order to fix all of the non-test instrument electronics it's always good to have an array of working good test instruments and second of all the other items I mentioned like everything else that is getting old and is being sold on eBay have some rising prices. I mean there's synthesizers out there now that are selling for more money in today's dollars now than they were in the late 70s or mid 70s and that trend is continuing. There's vintage computers which the only reason they're vintage is because they're really old uh, even those are going up in price and there's very few of those that most people can afford anymore. However, with test instrument that phenomenon hasn't kicked in. You can get test instruments mostly for a pretty good price. Uh, you know, some things that are still useful like old Tektronix curve traces and stuff like that still fetch, you know, uh, fetch a relatively high value for something that's 40 years old. But that's about it. One of the reasons for that is probably that it's hard to make an argument about a 40-year-old spectrum analyzer being, being really, really useful and better than what you can get today. That, that argument doesn't hold water and I think it carries over into most of the test instruments. So I think there will be a plentiful supply of test instruments at good prices uh, to come. And... Uh, for those two reasons, you will always see test instruments here, but uh, we will branch out into the more fun stuff. Uh, my favorite being the music stuff. But uh, if you enjoyed this and possibly learned something, please go ahead and subscribe. I will be making more episodes shortly. Bye.